Hi guys, this is Tom, this is Quick Watercolour Birds and we're back to a bird in flight in this one. So let's get in the mood with the intro. Okay, so I said we'd be painting more bee eaters because I absolutely love them. This particular one is a carmine bee eater. And as I said, we are gonna be diving into painting one of these in flight. And I don't think we've done a bird in flight since one of the very early ones, which was the raven. So for some reason with birds in flight, there seems to be a lot more room for lots of expression, lots of free flowing colors, uh, lots of kind of splashing about, and it all lends to the movement and the kind of dynamic feeling that we want with a watercolor bird. We still need to have those accurate shapes and kind of look for lines of rhythm to get nice movement. Um, we can exaggerate a few things which I'll talk about in the drawing stage, but firstly, I want to take a quick look at the colors. So firstly, we have phthalo blue, really, really powerful blue. It's got a nice turquoise feel, which will lend itself to um, the two more turquoisey blue areas of the bird. And also when combined with a red, which I'll talk about in a minute, gives us a really rich, deep dark. We do have to be careful of it because it's such a powerful blue. Our next color, and how could I not use it, is a carmine red. And this, when darker, is similar to a lizard and crimson, but as we lighten it up with water, um, it moves to something a bit closer to quinacridone magenta, like a little bit more vibrant and a little bit more pinky, which is perfect for some of the lighter areas of the bird. And I've also chosen to have a pyrrole red, which is a very orangey red. And when combined with the phthalo blue, they kind of cancel each other out and give us a really rich, deep dark. My yellow is a nice warm orangey yellow, which will complement the other two reds really nicely in this case, which is new gamboge. And then a couple of little squidges of other colours that I may or may not use. One is ultramarine blue, which I, I just always have on hand because I find it useful. It's a little bit more purple, a little bit more subdued. And then I have this lovely cobalt turquoise by Daniel Smith. I may find that the phthalo blue gives me the turquoise I want, or I might use the turquoise by Daniel Smith. So just before we dive in, I think probably the hardest thing here or the, the potential pitfall is that turquoise accidentally bleeding too much into some of the other colours. Because it's in a completely different part of the colour wheel, if that kind of greeny turquoise bleeds into either the yellow or the pinks or the reds, it's going to naturally subdue them. And whilst we might end up with some nice muted kind of subdued colors we don't actually want this in this case we want our colors to remain nice and clear so my biggest job here is to try and keep the turquoise separate all the other colors as long as i start light and i keep the light areas light we can just let all of that lovely yellow pinks reds all kind of flow together and have a bit of fun with it and the big one here is i don't really have a plan for how i'm going to splash the paint around we're just going to let it evolve naturally as we go so let's dive into the drawing and then into the painting Okay guys, so first things first, I try and get those big shapes in the right place. I really wanted to focus on the angle between the head and the body, very big kind of general oval shapes. The wings are obviously important, but they can kind of hang off the body once they're in place and relate to the head. And also we can exaggerate the tilt or the shape of those, whereas the body I needed to get a little bit more accurate. And then we hang the other shapes on top of that or around that. Um, so it's big to small shapes, general to specific, always looking for the negative shapes between the different parts of the bird and checking the proportions as we go. And then very, very slight rub just to take some of the darkness out and into the paint. Okay, so I'm gonna kick off with a nice, very watery pale mix of new gamboge and a little bit of tiny touch of red in there just to get things kicked off. So we're gonna start really light nice and warm and then we're going to slowly drop some of the pink colors into that a little bit dirty there and a little bit dark so i just mix them okay stop 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 right there that <laughs> this one did not work when i got to the end of this painting which you'll be seeing now i just did not like it at all and i thought initially let's just record another one and just show you that but i thought it was a really important uh, and interesting opportunity to show you what happens when things don't quite go as you want and that that happens to everyone, whatever your ability, whatever your experience level. So about three quarters of the way through this painting, I knew it wasn't really working, but I kind of followed through with it anyway. And basically what happened is I kind of overworked areas. And even more than that, I just went too dark 
and too heavy and it felt a little bit dead. I also was a little bit tight with my brushwork at the start because I hadn't probably warmed up as much as I should do. And I got to the end and I just didn't like it. It didn't have the feeling I wanted. I wanted it to feel looser, more expressive, much, much lighter in tone. Um, and so just very quickly before we dive into the one that actually worked, I just wanted to talk about what happens when we have failures or what we call failures, because inevitably we learn loads from paintings. Just because a painting doesn't work doesn't mean that we didn't learn lots from it. And this was the case with this one. So I took what I didn't like from it, which was the heaviness and the darkness and the slight tightness. And I really, really focused on those kind of three principles as I moved into my next painting immediately. And I think that's the thing with watercolour that we can do because it's such a quick medium or it can be a very quick medium we can very quickly set up the next painting and just get on with it and build upon the things that we didn't like and within half an hour an hour we can have a success and feel confident rather than spending the rest of the day feeling a bit down because our painting didn't work so moving into this next one all the same principles but keeping it lighter keeping the colors fresher and not so dark just a few little darks in places to kind of punch it up so let's get into this one and see how i do this time Okay guys, so here we go. Let's try again. So, we're going to start with New Gamboge with a tiny bit of the Carmine Red. And that's going to give us a lovely vibrant orange. Much more water in this as I want to keep it really light. Don't forget that colours like our oranges and our yellows, they do actually dry significantly um, lighter than we put them on because they tend to be a slightly weaker colour, when they're watered down a lot they will dry a lot lighter. So always remembering that we can go in much more intense than we think. And this is such a beautiful colour, we've got that beautiful transparent warm new gamboge mixed with the carmine red, really beautiful soft orange and then I'm going to feed into that almost pure carmine red. You can see when it's got that water mixed into it what an amazing vibrant pink it is, really really beautiful clear vibrant transparent pink and then I can kind of just drop it into the transparent new gamboge yellow and, and let it just do its thing. Um, I'm being very careful here to leave lots of the whites of the page and leave loads and loads of light areas. You can see there's loads of water in this and what this effectively does now is I've got this beautiful wet wash kind of um, just going over you know it's in the background it's also in the back of the bird and also down into the wing and as long as you keep it light and you keep it lots of water, lots of pigment, you can just let all of these colours flow together. We run into trouble, as you see, when we go too dark too quickly and we try just start trying to section off areas, but yet they run together and then we have to put in darks to maybe separate them or give more definition. And that's what I love about this stage, you can, and I love about watercolour, you just let it all run together. If an area goes a bit too dark, we can just chuck more water into it. The idea is that as long as a, wa a wash hasn't dried too much, you really can do what you like with it. You can chuck more clear water in and it will wash the pigment away, especially when you're working on a slight angle like this. I am thinking a little bit about where I want the colour to go, like I wanted more pink on this closest wing kind of in the area where I've got more pink so I chuck a bit more pigment in there but we also I wasn't at all worried about letting that kind of pink carmine run into the underwing and letting all of those colours just bleed into the background because we know that eventually we're going to have some darker tones on the wings and that will separate them from the background. So the focal point which is the head and like the shoulder or the wrist of the wing closest to us is a really fun area. What we're doing now is we've got a very sharp hard line. We've got the the slightly darker but very clear transparent colour on the head really trapping that very very striking white shape of the kind of the shoulder of the wing and that will really draw attention to that area. We'll have some very sharp hard marks uh, and some intense darks against the sharp white of the page so that will draw attention. Everywhere else is going to be a little bit softer a little bit more fuzzy, the colours will run together. We'll still have some definition in there, but nothing will be quite as defined as the the contrast of the head and the wing. And initially I intended to 
kind of soften the edges on that back bit of the bird um, uh, near the head, kind of the neck area. And I quite liked it as these kind of choppy, bold brush strokes rather than softening everything now. And here I'm just throwing a bit more pigment into it. That won't stay looking like a splatter. It will kind of merge in. But yet we get those kind of splatters disappearing away from the main washes. I think it's important to keep the edge or the front edge of the, the most foreground wing kind of sharp. Just on the left there, it's kind of poking out from the background wing. So I'm just going to work a little bit on the head here, starting to block in that turquoise. Notice how the turquoise at the back end of the bird I've let just disappear and melt into the wash, and I, I quite like that. On this front area, where well, it's a f the focal point, I'm being a bit more exacting, uh, and I want to keep it slightly sharper. I don't want that green, as I said in the intro, to shoot into the orange, because it will create that much more subdued colour, which in some cases we like, like at the back end, I want it to be more subdued. Yeah, in the, the head area, I want it to remain a little bit sharper and a little bit clearer and the colours to be a bit more separate. And then what I'm doing is slowly, slowly dropping in more intense pigment of that turquoise, so less water, more dark, and just letting it bleed. And now while I let that dry off, because I don't want to work in it while it's really sopping wet, as it is at the moment, as I let it dry off, I dot back over here. Um, and this area is now damp, so I'm working rather than very wet into very wet, I'm working more what I would call damp into damp. There's, there's still a watery nest to the paint, but it's got a lot more pigment in. I didn't like that mark I made, so instead of trying to correct it, actually I just take a big wash out and just break out from the tail. And These are the areas where I'm not necessarily planning things beforehand, I'm just kind of going with what the painting gives me. Um, and I quite like that. It always gives movement and a a sense of interest and some some opportunity for a soft edge it's hard to get a softer edge if we've got nothing to work into so we're going to have very sharp edge on the head as I've said and then we're going to have that much kind of softer edges to the wings where everything kind of flows together a bit more so for the first time we are diving into our thalo blue and we're going to work now into the head so this was an area in the first one where I just I got a bit heavy and I got a bit tight, I went too dark, I didn't leave enough light areas or whites of the page showing, so I'm diving in with the thalo blue to show the basic shape of the beak, leaving a lovely white bit of the page. I'm taking that thalo blue straight into the, um, straight into the, the turquoise on the head, but I'm also ever so slightly letting that thalo blue bleed a little bit into the still slightly damp pink of the underside of the bird and that will create like a soft purple. If I did it any sooner the really strong thalo blue would disappear into the pink and destroy it completely but what we get is a nice little soft transition and a bit of wet into wet action between the beak and the turquoise on the head and also then that same wash then continues into the peak on the underside and then if I time it just right um, I can then bring in the really lovely rich deep dark of that band across the eye um, and I've got to do it just right. If I'd gone in any sooner, again, this very rich dark made from the pyrrole red and the thalo blue would completely melt into the turquoise and destroy it. I'm being careful not to hit the pink too much. I don't mind, because of the paint consistency, I don't mind too much if they kind of touch because they will soften a little bit, but they're at a paint consistency where they're not going to completely destroy each other. Um, and I mean kind of melt into each other. And I'm purposely going to try and leave a little bit of white on the underside of um, the dark band, again to help liven up the area. And now we're letting those colours flow together and look how we're getting that beautiful purple next to the thalo blue, next to the turquoise, next to the pink. And all of the colours are remaining nice and clear and separate but they are also softening together to create interesting kind of incidental in-between colours and purposely then leaving those kind of abstract sort of areas of the whites of the page. And you can see how it doesn't take much in watercolour to make a subject feel a bit more finished. Look how finished the head feels and I don't do actually much more to it than this relative to how the much lighter areas feel which are pretty much dry now. Um, just on the shoulder where the wing meets the body or the neck 
I'm just pushing that darker and again that'll accentuate the feeling of sharp light on the front edge of the wing and it'll also give a sense of depth that the wing um, is coming out at us more and then is throwing the body into shadow just where it meets it. So now back to uh, Carmine and a little bit of new gamboge and with a mid-tone created from um, less water than the initial wash that I'm now working over the top of which is dry uh, and quite a lot of pigment that creates a mid-tone rather than the light and what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find slightly more exacting um, washes over the top of the now dry wash but still very transparent paint so that you see how the yellow that was light underneath is still influencing the color that I'm putting on top and then we have this lovely area of wash now and you can see how you can have a lot of fun with the paint just dropping in some really watery pigment letting it drip letting it run this is when you get those happy accidents that people talk about I'm now dropping in that new gamboge and we get this beautiful blush and I've got this lovely bead that's collected at the bottom that I'm working into now so that bead is really important because I can use that bead to um, connect different areas of the painting and look how that bead is just starting to run down and I just catch it in time and then I, it wasn't necessarily what I planned and this is where watercolour you kind of have to flow with what it gives you I had to take that wash into the underwing and eventually that wash was going to go into the underwing but I was planning to do it separately but I've kind of been um, quite happily forced into doing it in a slightly different way which is fine and that's watercolour and that's kind of what the fun of watercolour is we have to learn and to kind of roll with what it gives you so the trick here is now to work wet into wet but in a smaller area so we started with a very watery wet wash over a large area and now creating more of a half tone wash but still trying to keep it fairly light transparent um, with a light touch and I've created like this little smaller wash of this part of the wing that I'm working on now and it almost links in with the top part of the wing and now I'm working again damp into damp and this is allowing me to get these lovely kind of um, soft edges I'm sort of putting in detail but at the same time it's not really sharp hard detail it's um, it's softer detail and that's kind of what we want we are kind of introducing definition into the painting but it's not great big whacking hard darks it's um, more kind of soft mid-tones and because I'm working damp into damp we're getting lovely soft edges and just bringing a bit more definition into that background or that back edge of the wing here and then while that top wash is wet a bit more definition in there and you can see it doesn't take long notice how I'm not working the paint either it's quick hits of the brush quick brush strokes um, brush strokes into other wet areas not overly working the paint that's when we can disturb the pigment as it dries and if we disturb the pigment as it dries that's when we can get a little bit muddy but you see a bit more exacting slightly sharper marks a little bit of dry brush there over the top of our much broader initially very wet washes which were lighter and now this is what I would call like a slightly darker mid-tone um, and it's more intense it's got much more pigment look how on the palette where I was mixing it there's far less water in it it's staying where it is rather than pooling um, in, and flowing so this I would call maybe like double cream even slightly buttery consistency working into a damp wash so as I've said before in the other videos it's all about understanding what level of dry the paint that you're working into is is it very wet is it is it um, is it damp is it nearly dry or is it totally dry and combining that with really understanding how much pigment and how much water is in your brush have you is it very loose very wet tea consistency is it a bit more creamy is it double cream single cream or is it very very neat kind of buttery paint some people call it marmite or the vegemite consistency so it's really understanding that combination so here I'm working with what I would call slightly buttery or even the um the vegemite consistency into an almost dry wash and that's why I can't work the paint too much if I work the paint it will muddy if I just strike the brush strokes in there and let them do their thing 
would be okay. And you can see it's taken me quite a while to kind of sculpt the edge of this, or the front part of this um, of this bird. And then I go a little bit darker there, but decide it's a bit too dark. So I go in with a slightly softer color and, and hit it again to move some of that pigment away. Um, and that will help lighten the color. But you can see I'm slowly introducing dark. In some ways, aside from the head, which actually, although quite exacting, came together very quickly, the wing here is probably the most important bit because it's bang in the middle of the painting. It's probably, aside from the head, the most defined part of the painting. But it's also got a lot to work out. There's very different types of areas. There's area that needs a little bit more detail, um, like that front part of the wing. Um, there's there's areas that need to be a bit broader, there's areas that change tone and colour quite significantly and then there's other little bits of detail. And then I move into the wing and this is a very different type of red, there's more pyrrole red in this but a bit of new gamboge and a bit of the carmine. It gives us a slightly stronger if not slightly darker more orangey red as opposed to the like pinky softy red that I've got on the back of the wing or the more orangey yellow colour on the front of the wing. And again, I've now created um, a new smaller wash over the top of the much bigger broader wash. And the job here is to work out how to connect these areas. In watercolour you find that it's really important to connect different areas together, or certainly areas of similar tone, even if they're different types of area together. So this bit was a hard bit because I, I had to be brave to take the yellow straight over the turquoise which initially feels odd and it gives us this weird green that we don't necessarily think we want but we kind of have to trust the watercolour to do its thing and actually that is a really lovely blush of green in amongst all the red and what I'm effectively doing now is that top wing is casting a shadow over the the lower further back wing and I'm effectively glazing in a reasonably dark mid-tone here uh, but again, letting the colour from the tail run into the yellow wash over the dry turquoise into the yellowy pinky wash of the underside there. So we've got a continued wash from the tail into the kind of underside area and into the wing here. And then just while it's wet, I decide to strike in a little bit more depth of tone because it makes sense that this turquoise is predominantly in shadow. And if it's shadow, we want kind of a softer feeling to the form because of the bounced or ambient light, which is not as strong as the direct light. So we get a much softer form in there. Uh, colors tend to blur together more in the shadows. There's less definition, there's less detail. And that's what I'm doing here. That's why I'm trying to work this area while it's still wet. So we get that kind of shadowy feeling. And we're getting to a point, there we go, I was brave enough to just push it that little bit darker, but very wary of going too dark, especially after round one where I just went too dark too quickly. And just to kind of finish off this first pass on the bird, I'm just going to sharpen up some of the edges in the shadows here. And then that's a really good place for the painting to kind of stop and slow down. Um, and we're going to take a little break from it and look at the, as always, the quick tip section where we look at how I lay out my palette and some of the pros and cons of laying out your palette in different ways and kind of why it's important. So let's take a look at that. Hi guys and welcome to the quick tip section for this video. I'm going to talk about something that's seemingly a little bit boring but actually something that's very important and that's how you lay out your palette. Now the important thing here is you don't have to lay your palette out like I do and there's lots of different types of palettes so I'll talk through those in a sec because the way I lay this out is relevant to every type of palette I use and it's a bit of a hangover from my oil painting days and I still use the same kind of palette orientation for my acrylics too. And one of the great things about having a kind of regular way that you set up your palette is that as time goes on you won't have to think too much about where your colours are. That will become second nature so that you can focus on your painting a little bit more uh, and the, the colours are always to hand where I know they will be. So very simply my colours with watercolour basically go from dark to light and basically they move through the blues into the reds which on the whole are a little bit lighter and then into the oranges kind of and down to the yellows i reserve this little section here for what i would call my convenience colors but also my slightly more interesting colors in terms of the fact that they 
I don't always use them. Um, and also they're opaque. I've mentioned a few times that I prefer working with um, that I prefer working with transparent colours because it's much harder to get that kind of muddy overworked look. And I'm very careful with my opaque colours. So we've got like a lavender here, a, an opaque turquoise and another turquoise would usually be there. And a hooker's green, which I didn't use that often. But like I said, that's like convenience colours. And because they're kind of off to the corner here, I have to be more conscious about going to them. Whereas this is kind of my normal palette area and I know exactly where everything is. So for example, I would have Prussian blue there very deep, very dark, very powerful. Thalo blue, a little bit lighter, very cool and greeny, uh, but yeah, very dark. Ultramarine, a tiny touch lighter. And then these, yeah, uh, these blues here, although they are kind of slightly lighter than some of the darker reds, it makes sense just to have all the blues here. So I quite often have, um, I do have an ultramarine blue light. I also have a cobalt blue and a manganese blue. And I know those are all in that little top section there and they're right to hand when I need them. Here I usually have either quinacridone red, quinacridone magenta, or in this case, the carmine. So that's my dark cool red goes there and I vary that a little bit. I have a pyrrole red here and I have a nice and orangey and vibrant. And then I sometimes have a permanent red here or a naphthal red. So those are slightly lighter reds. Burnt sienna I like having here because although it's quite dark, it feels natural to kind of just slot it in there. I then move into my oranges, like this one is a permanent orange, I think. It might sometimes be yellow orange. At the moment, I've got a big blob of new gamboge yellow, but there's also a dried blob of Indian yellow, because don't forget, you can reignite your dry colours. This is a bit of a funny one. It's actually darker than that, but I just like having it here. So like I said, you do it a way that feels comfortable, but as time goes on, try and make it consistent. That's an Aussie red gold. And although it looks very dark, as soon as I add white uh, or water into that, I should say, it lightens it up. Uh, and it's a really vibrant, warm yellow that's quite bright. Then we're down to a cool but lighter yellow, which is lemon yellow, but you might have Oriolin or Imidazolone yellow. And then as I said, we've got these kind of colors here. So I'm always talking about trying to limit your palette so it keeps things simple. And as this stands, I've got a little bit of every single color out. So you've got two options. One is that you squeeze fresh paint out for the painting you're gonna do. And this is the fresh paint for the one that we've already started. But you can easily dip into these if you need to, which is sometimes a good thing, sometimes a bad thing, because actually you don't wanna overcomplicate your color mixing. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of other palette options. This is a different palette I use, but I use exactly the same principle. It goes blue, the darks, through to my mid-tones and reds, right down to my kind of yellows, and then I reserve my slightly more opaque or unusual colours for this bottom right corner. If I want to purposely embrace yourselves here for a very dirty palette, which I'll get onto in a sec, if you want to be more specific with the colours you're using and you don't want to accidentally have all these to hand, this is what I love about this one because there's far less room for colors. Yeah, I still operate exactly the same principle. It's a bit hard to see at the moment because it's an absolute mess, but my darker blues here, depending on what color combinations I have, slightly lighter blues there. Moving into my reds here, yellows here, and kind of a reserve pot if I need it. And that's more kind of flexible, but the same principle always applies, whatever combination of colors, dark to light, and even, when I'm down to my little miniature travel one, the same principle applies. The one which I can never open. I barely use these colours, so you can almost ignore that side. And basically it goes from your dark blues through to your light yellows. Dead simple, same principle applies. The last thing I wanted to talk about is something that people ask a lot, is about washing out your palette. And generally we want our watercolours to be nice and clear and bright and vibrant, yet at the same time, some of the best kind of muted subdued colors that you'll ever get are from mixing all of your kind of leftover colors in one area. But I want nice clear colors in other areas. So what I tend to do is I leave this one dirty always. I never clean this one and in, it just ends up with leftover from all the different paintings. And that can give you really subdued colors if you're careful. One thing I'm very specific not to do is to ever take opaque color and put it in there. If I'm mixing opaque colour, I reserve it for just this bit here. This tends to naturally be my lighter colours because the yellows are kind of here, kind of light warm colours. Uh, and then we've got this giant section here. 
and this is great for mixing colour in. And although you might think that all the colours will run together, actually it's purposely slightly raised in the middle here, so that you can mix your colours here, and if they've got water in them, they're kind of dropped down into the corners. So actually, surprisingly, you can keep your colours very separate in this area, although I do sometimes clean it if it's a big painting as I'm going. Um, and that's kind of it, guys. So I tend to clean these after every painting, keep that one dirty. And that's basically it, how to lay out your palette. You don't have to do it like me, but have a go at making it consistent so everything you want is always to hand and it becomes second nature. So let's dive into the second part of this painting. Okay, so what next? We just need to push some of those darks darker. We can get away with some deeper darks in the shadow area. This area is drying but still not wet so it's got that kind of damp consistency. Nearly dry and the pigment that I've just put on is pretty much the Vegemite consistency so it's dark, rich in pigment, not too much water and just striking those quick brush strokes into um, the kind of existing damp washers uh, is what gives us the finish of a watercolour. It starts to push the shadows a bit darker. It also gives us the definition, as you see, it starts to pull it out and away from the lighter wash behind. I felt like I'd gone a little bit too sharp with those marks there, so I just went in with a damp brush and kind of destroyed it again, basically, and made it more abstract um, and not so exact, it, uh, almost better for being exact. I really love the transition of colour that I've managed to get in the um, the kind of back wing there. We've got that beautiful turquoise flowing into new gamboge and creating a bit of green and then flowing very gently into a kind of peach colour and a little bit of that strong carmine from the front wing has actually bled into the back wing but it really doesn't matter. Again I think that's watercolour at its best and again I felt like the line there was a bit too sharp um, so what I did was just go in with a damp wash while it was still wet and look to just connect it and create a softer, more damp kind of edge so that we didn't just have a perfectly sharp edge from the underside of the bird running all the way along the wing. Um, felt like it didn't work at this stage, may go back in and change it but it didn't work at that stage. And then in order to make this interesting I just chucked in loads of water, loads of pigment. As I said you can't go too wrong with transparent paint kind of chucking it all together like that um, as long as everything's still wet. That's the secret. Once it's dried or it's almost dry, then that's it. You've you've kind of you're done then. Um, but while it's wet, you can you can really chuck the paint around. Just double checking distances there, feeling like the head. Um, just checking the head size basically. What was the distance from the tail to the wing versus the tail, uh, or the wing to the head? and just checking I got the proportion right. Not that there was much I could do about it if I hadn't, but I, I just wanted to feel a bit better about it basically. And we're kind of in some ways on the home straight here. For me the hardest part of the painting is done. Um, there's still a lot of areas we could go wrong and potential pitfalls. Most of them would be in making it too fussy, overworking the paint, adding too much dark, stuff like that. But for me the hardest part of the painting is done. Uh, the initial wash is really fun. That middle part of the painting where we have to start pushing it towards the finish a bit more um, is really tricky. It's where we can go a little bit wrong. I felt like I went a bit too hard there so I went back in with some kitchen roll and just pulled out some of the pigment. A great example of feeling like I need to do more than I actually need to do. Like There's a lot of these areas that work as they are and actually as I'm looking at this on screen I could probably have left it where it is now quite happily. Um, we do continue for like another five minutes or so and the idea is not to push it too much further but just there's areas where we could go a little bit darker. Add a little bit more definition um, but I could argue now looking at this in hindsight that maybe it doesn't necessarily need it. So the trick is to push it towards more of a finish without pushing it too far without pushing it too dark, without pushing in too much detail, and without overworking the paint. It's still kind of wet in this area, um, and I'm thinking here, do I need to connect that b bottom area into the wing? 
I go for it. Was it the right decision or not? I think either one was the right decision. I could have quite happily left it and it would have looked good. I like the way I've done it because it was a big bold brush stroke. If I'd kind of overworked it and over fussed it, it probably wouldn't have been the right decision, but it's got a sort of a nice feeling of a bold brush stroke to it. And then because this underside of the wing is in shadow, I'm making the decision to kind of push it a little bit darker. What I don't want to do is take then that dark into the the any further into that bottom wing. Um, the idea is that the where I've just done the deep dark is in shadow, so it would be darker, and yet we still get a nice sharp kind of strong um, kind of bottom edge to the the background wing, which is sharp enough to denote the wing and give us a bit of definition, but not so dark it it's too overpowering. And now while I've got that, I'm just trying to find the balance of a little bit more detail on the front edge of this front wing to try and pull it out from the wing behind, uh, just to create a bit of depth. We've got a kind of a sharp, dark edge on the front wing against a very, very, very light wash in the background. And again, that contrast creates a bit of depth. We've then got the, the more shadowy area of the front wing casting further shadow on the underside of the back wing so we're, we are creating this contrast of light and shadow trying to create a little bit of depth not being afraid to leave lots of whites of the page in places even where they wouldn't necessarily think that they literally need to be a little bit of a darker mark here just helps further that feeling of depth that just pulls that front wing forward and above the back wing um, which i think is important And we really are homing in on the finish here. It's such a funny one with watercolour. You think it's kind of, um, it's taking a while to come together and then suddenly you realise actually there's not that much to do, uh, <laughs> which is kind of the stage I'm at here. You, like I said, you could argue some of the bits that I left it, um, or if I'd left it maybe five minutes ago, it would have been funnish, but I'm, I'm happy with the decisions I've made to push this forwards. Um, I'm just I'm sharpening up a few edges. The the stronger red that I put in there, I feel is a stronger red to bring the painting to life. I also wanted to really emphasise the feeling of a cast shadow on the wing. So that sharper red mark kind of denotes that shadow a little bit more. As you can see I, I actually at this point feel like the painting is finished and go for the signature. For me, I, I like doing the signature because it feels like I've kind of said, right, the painting is finished or as good as finished. I'm not someone that thinks you shouldn't sign it unless you're 100% sure it's done. For me, it marks a point in the painting where I am as good as finished and I might easily leave it there. But as you'll see, after doing the signature and making that commitment to it being finished, I just feel like there's a few more marks to do. It just needs that little extra something to bring it to life. In acrylic, you can add lights and little zings and pops of light. In watercolour, we don't have that luxury. So it has to come from either kind of colourful accents or pushing in more shadows or darker tones to create form and depth. And so what I'm doing here is just popping on the odd, tiny little extra dark accent just to give more definition to that front wing and create a little bit more depth. And that again is with that kind of saturated paint. Um, I've done a much better job of leaving that tail much lighter and looser. You'll see me make a little change to it right at the end in a minute though. But one thing that I do here is I just feel like the intensity of colour is lacking a bit on the back. So I mix an almost pure pyrrole red with a little bit of the new gamboge to create a very strong transparent ready orange. And I use that ready orange just to give a little bit more definition on the back and pull it away from the kind of yellow splash. I use a little bit of dry brush work because that can make a painting feel more finished. And I'm effectively using this orange as like I said a minute ago, like a colour accent just to make the final piece pop. Like I just feel like it needs a little bit more warmth here, a little bit more of that red warmth there. And it's almost like a soft glaze just to slightly influence the colour of an area. See, I'm just warming up and saturating more with orange 
that area. This little back of the wing I felt needed a little bit more colour. I don't want to add necessarily too much definition. I don't want to alter the tune, the tone too much, although inevitably it goes to a slightly darker tone. What it's doing is just warming it up, glazing a little bit of warmth over the top. And then the very final touch here, and this is using white gouache or Chinese white, an opaque colour, something you really don't want to do too much and it's something I've spoken about a little bit in other videos, but I just felt like the, the tail was too solid and too heavy even still. So there we go guys, despite the minor hiccup, which I felt... Uh, so there we go guys, despite the minor hiccup, which I felt it important to show, I actually ended up being really happy with it. And I'd be interested to know actually if you preferred the first one or the second one. Um, I much, much prefer the second one. From a painter's point of view, it's much more what watercolour is about. Lots of transparent colour. I didn't go too heavy, I didn't go too dark. I left more whites of the page, which make it feel a bit more lively. In some ways it's a little bit more abstract and it doesn't maybe quite hold together in the same way that the first one did but I feel like there's just enough information in the important areas to make it a working painting. So I hope you enjoyed that one guys. Don't forget you can join me over on Patreon where you can find the line drawing. I also have loads of other tutorials on there, not just watercolour and not just birds but there's an other, ever increasing amount of that sort of stuff on there. Just for an example at the tutorials tier, the latest video that I've done is a big long tutorial on really nailing down the specifics of colour mixing and watercolour. I get deep into the theory of it but I also show you three different examples of how to use watercolour um, over three different subjects looking at different colour mixing problems and how to overcome them. One of those is a bird, the other two are something a little bit different so check out all the links below and you can find me there. Don't forget I am on Instagram where I'm particularly active, probably my most active social media. You can also find my website tomshepherdart.com where you can sign up to my newsletter and please don't forget guys if you like this video feel free to share it. Giving me a thumbs up and a like is a huge huge help and if you want to see more of these videos because there's going to be loads more to come including two more little mini series which I'm going to start up don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Until next time guys happy painting, happy living, happy creating and I shall catch you in the next episode.